Today on Inside Utah Politics, slavery in Utah. It's still referenced in the state constitution, but voters can change that in November. We're digging into the effort to make that happen. Plus, a big battle over the vacancy on the nation's highest court. Will Republicans be able to confirm the president's nominee before Election Day? Our panel weighs in. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go Inside Utah Politics. We begin today with Francis James and Jenny Magana with the Utah Coalition to Abolish Slavery. They're here to discuss the effort to remove slavery references from the Utah Constitution. Ladies, thanks so much for being here. It's great to have you. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank uh, you. Let's start off uh, with uh, references that are actually made in the state constitution. A lot of people hear that and say, I had no idea. But uh, Francis, let's start with you. Talk about the specific references, references still in the constitution today. Thanks, Glenn. So currently, as our Utah State Constitution reads in Article 1, Section 21, um, the verbiage surrounds it says something along the lines of neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except for as punishment of a crime whereby the person shall be duly convicted shall exist in this state. So that's currently as our Utah State Constitution reads. What Amendment C is proposing is to change that legislation and that wording in two ways. So first off, it would eliminate that exception clause to read that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the state, period. Secondly, it would include verbiage to clarify subsection one um, to state something along the lines of that this amendment will, know, will not change the article um, as it pertains to legal administration of the criminal justice system. Right, and that, that's a good point we want to hit on right there because I remember early on when we started first talking about this, there was some concern about unintended consequences as, a, as it uh, might pertain to the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and incarceration in particular, but those things have been worked out. Yes, sir, correct. Okay. Uh, Jenny, let's uh, bring you in on the conversation. One of our reporters, Brittany Johnson, a former colleague of mine, was the first one to bring this to light in the public and, and bring this up after we saw reports from the same thing in another state. She went and checked the Utah Constitution and sure enough, there it was. Mm -hmm. Jenny, what were your thoughts when you first found out that slavery is still referenced in the Utah Constitution to this day? Um, honestly, Glenn, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it's still in this con Utah State Constitution. Um, it's such an old thing um, even though it is on our federal constitution, I just couldn't imagine it would be in our state constitution where um, it's something symbolic, but also it's a proper document which we need to change. Francis, what were your thoughts when you first uh, heard this? Yeah, as a California native and as descendants of slaves, um, I was absolutely astonished. I really couldn't believe that a state that values freedom could have, you know, something as barbaric such as slavery in the Constitution. And so I was astonished and quite frankly disappointed, not entirely surprised, unfortunately. Um, but I'm super happy to hear that it's on our ballot in November and that we have the opportunity to abolish it once and for all. Yeah, we'll get into more in that in just a minute. But let's talk about the process to get there. State Representative Sandra Hollins opened a bill file to uh, put this on the ballot because it does need to be approved anytime we amend the Constitution by the voters, but mm -hmm. it has to go through the legislature as well. This was a bipartisan effort, unanimous vote, not one single no vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you both mentioned that you were disappointed and, and shocked to see that that's still in the Constitution, but what about that effort when you saw it fly through the legislature the way it did? Did that make you feel good about the effort? I mean, definitely, knowing that we had Representative Hollins as well as Representative Anderegg, you know, standing on two sides of the aisle coming together to pass this unanimous, unanimously, not only through the um, State House, but as well as the State Senate, um, that's incredible. And to hear um, Representative Anderegg on Tuesday at the presser mention how 100% he is behind this amendment as well as the efforts behind it, um, it leaves me proud as a voter, as a citizen, um, you name it. Yeah, Representative Hollins and Senator Andreg are not typically the two you would think would come together <laughs> on an issue, and they certainly did in this one. Jenny, your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, honestly, um, I was born and raised in Utah, and it's crazy to think that this is the one thing that um, all both parties doesn't matter. Um, people of different walks of life are agreeing to this and it just passed unanim unanimously and it's amazing, honestly. And I hope that this gives a, an idea to the people to vote for this amendment and that they will see that this isn't a, um, it's more of a moral issue, it's a human right and it shouldn't be in our um, state constitution. 
Amendment C. It's what you will see on your ballot in November. Uh, Francis, you already got into this a little bit, but what is it about Amendment C specifically that you would want our viewers right now to know about? I want our viewers to know that Amendment C, it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with you know, what your political values are. It's a moral issue. It's a value, and it's something that we as Utahns believe that it shouldn't exist. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's immoral. And so as we think about why we should vote for Amendment C, we should vote for freedom. And you know, being that we're voting for freedom, we should say that all Utahns have the right to pick um, the, value, the values that they believe in as well as the lifestyles they want to live. And so by having slavery in our Constitution, it inevitably counteracts that. And so if we believe in freedom, if we believe in the right to pick the way we live, then we have to abolish slavery so that, to ensure that we are all equal across the board. Jenny, what's, what's your message to the voters of Utah when it comes to Amendment C? Um, as a Utahan, I believe that we should all be treated equally, have our own choice, and that doesn't happen if this is in our Constitution. Um, it's something that's important. It's something that it affects uh, certain communities, but overall it affects the whole entire state. We shouldn't have this in our Constitution. It should have never been in the Constitution, and we have a time to change it. As a result of, of this issue, the Utah Coalition to Abolish Slavery was formed. I already mentioned the two of you are part of that coalition. Uh, Francis, let's start with you. Why did you jump to get involved in this issue? Like I said, slavery isn't a matter of politics. It is a matter of what I believe in, you know, on the right or the left. It's a moral issue, and especially as a black woman, I don't want to see slavery in our state constitution, nor do I want to see it in our United States Constitution, but we're going to get to that. And so as we attack this slavery in our, in our Constitution, I want to believe that I can live in a state that I'm free to exercise my decisions, to live equally to my peers. And so it was a no-brainer when I had the opportunity to join the coalition to abolish slavery in the state of Utah once and for all. Jenny, the coalition had a uh, press conference on Tuesday to kind of lay out the education plan and where we go from here. Talk about that. Yeah, so we had this presser event to kick off the entire um, education campaign. This is very important because we wanted to show that the whole entire state agrees that this shouldn't be in our constitution. So from that, from now on, we will be doing ads, educating the public, doing videos. You can even post it on social media that you're voting for a ballot C and, or an amendment C on the ballot and why you should be voting for it. Francis, uh, talk about how our viewers can contact, uh, connect with, the, with your organization, your coalition, and learn more about this amendment and the effort that you are putting forward. Definitely. So if you want the full rundown of Amendment C, you can go to www.abolishslaveryutah.org um, to get everything that we believe in, the background behind it, statements from Representative Hollins, etc. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Abolish Slavery Utah. Um, on, I believe that's on Instagram, and then vote for Amendment C on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you can get up-to-date updates from what we're doing, um, education campaign, et cetera, you name it. So you can find us everywhere on social media, um, and we're hoping that you will get involved. Okay, sounds good. And, and you brought something up, Francis, I want to hit on real quick. We have about 30 seconds left. Uh, do you believe tackling this at the state level is the step to the national level? Definitely. As amendments, as our current constitution reads, it's a basically a copy of the 13th Amendment. So if we ever want to tackle this at a national level, we have to start at states and abolish it from our state constitution, and then we can get to abolishing the 13th Amendment for good. Thank you for your time. Very important conversation and a good one as well. We appreciate having you with us. Thanks for having us. Still to come, it's back to orange or moderate risk phase for the cities of Orem and Provo. Will it make any difference? Our panel debates a little bit later. But first, a bipartisan group of lawmakers trying to end the stalemate on the COVID stimulus package in the nation's capital. How the Problem Solvers Caucus is approaching the issue.
Welcome back. The Congressional Problem Solvers Caucus, a group of 25 Democrats and 25 Republicans, continues to push for a compromised COVID stimulus package, including another round of direct payments to taxpayers and enhanced unemployment benefits. As Washington correspondent Morgan Wright reports, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the bill still is not big enough. If we can get this done, uh American people would be better off for it. New York Congressman John Katko says the plan from the Problem Solvers Caucus will help Americans through a $1,200 direct payment and boosted unemployment benefits. It gives you a premium of $600 above the unemployment insurance, but it caps it at what your what your income was before you were unemployed. Katko and New York Congressman Anthony Brindisi say it's wrong to make the American people wait any longer for relief. There are folks who are still out of work that need additional unemployment assistance. There are small businesses that are still hurting and need additional PPP loans. So far, congressional leadership are rejecting the plan, but Brindisi says other lawmakers are ready for a deal. I would be willing to bet if you put our plan on the floor tomorrow uh, in the House and the Senate, it would pass with overwhelming bipartisan support. The bipartisan group says despite rejection from party leaders, they're making progress and building the momentum needed to pass the next COVID relief package. The number of members that have come up and joined us in this effort uh, means a deal has to be done. New York Congressman Tom Reed, co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, says the White House has even signaled its support. And this is about what's needed for the American people. American people are still suffering. Reed says lawmakers have two weeks to get a deal done. Reporting in Washington, I'm Morgan Wright. The coronavirus has killed more than 200,000 people across the country, making the U.S. death toll now the highest in the world. That's according to new data released by Johns Hopkins University. In the nation's capital, a group of volunteers memorializing the lives lost by placing 200,000 American flags at the Washington Monument facing the White House. Washington correspondent Anna Wernicke has more. One by one, a group of volunteers planted 20,000 American flags on the National Mall. To represent the 200,000 people who have died so far in the U.S. of COVID-19. That's one flag for every 10 American lives lost to the coronavirus. Each flag, it's just supposed to be in a remembrance of them. Carmen Wilkie, a volunteer organizer, says because of the pandemic, many families weren't able to hold a proper funeral. Having re representation of them here shows that in the Capitol, we are thinking of them. We remember them. They will not be forgotten. On Tuesday morning, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi planted the final flag. Just look at the lives lost and multiply it. Pelosi says lawmakers need to work together to fight the virus, not each other. This was preventable, not all of it, but much of it. And what could be lost in the future is preventable, too, if we embrace science. Science instead of politics. There's been a, a lot of very uh, big divisiveness in the country over the last several months. There's a lot going on in people's lives. But today, Elliot Vice, another volunteer, says it's about remembering. 200,000 of our fellow oh. Americans dead is something that we really think people should take some time to honor their lives. The flags will remain in place through sunset on Wednesday. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. Coming up, Republicans are vowing to get the president's Supreme Court nominee confirmed while Democrats say they'll pull out all the stops. Our panel weighs in after the break. You're watching Inside Utah Politics. Time now to debate some of the big stories of the week with the Inside Utah Politics panel. This week we have former Hinckley Institute of Politics Director Kirk Jowers and former Salt Lake City Councilman Charlie Luke. Gentlemen, glad to have you with us. Good to be here. Yeah, uh, too bad we don't have anything to talk about, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a boring week. Yeah, let's jump right into it. The SCOTUS vacancy. The question, will Republicans get the confirmation through before Election Day? Kirk, let's start with you. They can, and so they probably will, but it is with some with some peril, of course. There's we we've watched this on all levels with with the with the U.S. Senate. 
you can put the blame on Harry Reid starting it or, or go back a little bit on the Republican, but they just keep upping the ante, changing the rules, changing traditions, and so one bad turn will always get another, and so they've got to be prepared for that. At some point, there's got to be some fundamental changes uh, because there's just no way one party's going to take the hit and just let it pass. Boy, yeah. that is a good point, and I want to dig into future consequences a little bit more, but uh, do you believe they will indeed push it through before Election Day? I believe they will. The Democrats do have some uh, kind of parliamentary tricks they can try to use, but again, Harry Reid did some things which uh, right. makes it pretty easy for the Republicans to throw those aside that they could not have a decade ago. So yeah, if they want it, they can get it. The only thing that could really undo it is if the person they choose has some some skeletons that are worse than Republicans know about and and it kind of comes up and it requires a much more thorough vetting which which pushes that very tight timeline just a little too far yeah hey, Charlie, I, I agree. Uh, do you, you think know, that's going to happen absolutely um, mm -hmm. I think that I think that the Republicans are, are will do that and and I think it's unfortunate but you know Kirk brought up you know some very good points um, the issue right now is you know it goes beyond Trump, it goes beyond um, McConnell. It, what we, where, where we are right now is not a good place. Um, the, the reason that this country has been as successful as we have been and that we've, uh, in, in terms of having a democratic republic, survive as long as we have is because we, do, we have had that, that direct separation of powers. And unfortunately, that is disappearing. Um, politicians are, are rewarded for being polarizing. They're rewarded not for you know, crossing the lines. The days of, of Hatch and Kennedy and those types of friendships really are, are gone. You know, we don't have the opportunities. When you look at the United States Senate and what the United States Senate used to be and what it has been in our history and the, in the incredible things that the Senate has done, I don't think you could accomplish it right now. You couldn't pass a civil rights bill. You couldn't pass a voting yeah. rights bill. I, and um, everyone feels justified in taking that next yeah. step because they immediately look back and say, oh, and you well, can blame Harry somebody Reed else. did right. this. Well, yeah. you know. Yeah, so never but ends. the thing is, the Senate has always been a place where it was the least of the political, uh, you know, of between the House and the Senate. The House mm -hmm. was all, and, that, and that's what right. the, the founders <laughs> intended. The House was always supposed to be more of a free-for-all. The Senate was supposed to be, you know, dignified and, 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 you know, having quorum and everything. But, you know, we're not seeing that now. And I think that's what's unfortunate. Um, you know, both, I think both parties are to blame for this. We can't just blame uh, the, the Republicans. I think, you know, Kirk mentioned Harry Reid. You know, when, when uh, McConnell wasn't allowing any of the uh, federal judges to be sworn in uh, or, or even voted on, um, that's when Harry Reid and the Democrats changed the, the 60 vote rule right, the uh, to, a minim, to a minimum or a, a simple majority. And that's where we are now. And the Democrats can say, well, we wouldn't have done that. We don't know because the reality is the Republicans are doing it. Well, and we right. do remember at that time McConnell warning Harry Reid. Yeah. Be careful what you're doing here yeah. because of what can happen down the road, just like you two gentlemen are talking about now. Where does it go from yeah. here? Not, I mean, it's, it's, not a good, it's not a good direction because the separation of powers is really what has been, you know, fundamentally, you know, has separated us from, from other countries. The interesting thing is that uh, for President Trump, who, if nothing else, is really good at, at kind of narcissistic self-preservation, the best thing he could probably do is somehow let this slip just beyond the election so that way now of course with early voting it, it makes it it makes it a little tougher but it would make kind of the more pragmatic Republicans who have a difficult time with Trump to say uh, I wasn't going to vote for him but now yeah. I'm not really voting for him I'm voting for I you wanted know, to bring Amy Barrett or something I'm like that. I'm glad you bring that up yep. because back in 2016 we saw that same thing where the Supreme Court came to the top priority of a lot of Republicans who were struggling with voting for the president. I think most. And we may be in that exact same yeah. spot. Most pragmatic Republicans who were adamantly opposed to, to Trump as he was coming through that field of 16, and they finally made the decision mm -hmm. to vote for him over Clinton. Obviously, they didn't like Clinton. That made it easier. But their number one reason on the four side was federal judiciary. And they really liked that list that he put out early. Remember right. that in 2016? Mm -hmm. Should Biden yeah. do that right now, Charlie? Should he put out a list saying, this is who I would pick for the Supreme Court? I, at, at this point, you know, with, with 40 something days or 39 days to the election, I don't know. 
Um, I think that it, it, it should have happened earlier if you were going to do it. I think it's, it's probably a little bit late now. Um, but, but really, you know, it, it, we have to get back to the point where the Supreme Court is, le it, it, it's not a political body. I mean, the, the whole purpose of having lifetime judges um, is because it was to avoid the politics. And yeah. unfortunately, yeah, we're starting, we we're starting today, to right? see, and it, but it's, you know, and it started, I don't know if it started with Bork, but, you know, it, you know where you have mm. a lot of very direct, uh, you know, conversations and debates about specific judges, yeah. it, it, the, the system has become much more political. Kirk, question for you. Yes. Back in 2016, uh, President Obama put forward Merrick Garland. A lot of Republicans liked him. He was considered a pretty moderate pick. Really Knowing what judge. we're seeing today and this, these future consequences that you're talking about, should the Republicans have just mon moved forward with Merrick Garland? If you're a, a pure Republican, then no. Merrick Garland was probably the best judge a Democratic president could have put forth. He's, he's relatively centrist, reasonable. On a few issues, um, he actually leans a little probably right. Um, a very decent man by all accounts. But I think to most Republicans, the best judge that Obama would, would nominate would be worse than the worst that a Republican could nominate. And so they had the votes, and so they didn't do it. The biggest problem the Republicans have is not that they did it. They probably should have just said what now Senator Lee is saying now is, President has the right to nominate. Senate has the right for advice and consent. Obama did his job with Garland. We did ours. Done. But instead, you have people like Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio who tried to make it this big moralistic, mm -hmm. let the voters decide, and now it lays the hypocrisy. And we have there. all the video to look back on yep. from four years ago. Yep. Well, and they, 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 even more than that, they, they said, you know, use my words against me. Right. And so, and then they get mad when the media <laughs> does that. It's kind of like read my lips. Like, <laughs> You know, you got to be pretty sure yeah. when you throw that type of gauntlet yeah. out. Charlie, uh, I want to ask you about a point that Kirk just brought up in that Senator Lee is saying, look, he put forward uh, Garland. We did our advice and consent and we turned him down. That, did they it's really not true. do that? No, they didn't. I mean, that is completely false. <laughs> um, and, and, and to Kirk's point, own it. You know, if, if you want to politicize something, then, then own it. You know, and, and I think you're starting to see some of them, some of them doing that now. Um, but, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, try to make a, a process that has become politicized um, into something, you know, acting like it's, it's normal operating procedure. Kirk, this are, you is okay, not. are you okay with uh, Senator Lee saying now we did do our advice and consent? Yeah, and as far as, uh, at least the way he's defining it now, I, I agree that it, it's evolved for basically every Republican since 2016. But the Constitution says X and we are doing X. But it, it was a pure power play that the Republicans did in 16. There was nothing moralistic about it. There was nothing about we should let the voters decide. It was they had the votes to stop it and they did and now they've got the votes to get and, one and they're going to use it. And that's the point that President Trump is making the most. Charlie, if this were flipped, would we be seeing the same thing? Um, I don't think so. If the Democrats. I, I honestly don't think so. Um, and I think that the Democrats are going to, I think you're going to, you will start seeing, you know, a change in, in Democratic uh, elected officials. I think that, you know, by and large, you, you look at Merrick Garland, for example. I mean, that's a perfect, a perfect example because he is a moderate. He is a centrist. Um, and everyone that Trump is talking about is not. Okay. And so if the process is going to be political, just own it. Okay, you know, we have that's, about, that's where we I have about 20 Senate. seconds left, Kirk. I'll give you the last word. Would the, if the tables were turned, would it be going through the same thing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's what we've seen back and forth uh, with the Senate over the last certainly decade is each side, when they have, when they have a little advantage, they take it. And the customs of the Senate that used to uh, prevail upon our worst instincts are gone and so right. we've just seen both parties uh, basically do the wrong thing. We had so <laughs> many other things we needed to get to but we took all of our time on that one but that was a great conversation gentlemen thanks so much for being here we appreciate it and thank you. Stay with us we'll be right back with more Inside Utah Politics right after the break.
We leave you now with a look at what's on the radar in the world of politics. The one and only vice presidential debate is happening right here in Utah. It's set for Wednesday, October 7th up at the University of Utah. Mail-in ballots will go out the following week of October 12th. And then Election Day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Make sure to connect with me on social media. I'd like to know what you think of this show and other issues that are important to you. You can email me at InsideUtahPolitics at ABC4.com. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Just log on and search Glenn Mills ABC4. Thanks so much for making us part of your day. We hope to see you again next week as we go Inside Utah Politics.